Let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, great poet of all poets, please bless and invigorate this class so that through reading the works and words of others, we may draw nearer to you. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start a, a minute with apologetics. I mean, why on earth are we having a poetry class? Well, this actually is one of Father Andrew's favorite quotes from Mary Oliver, who was at one time Poet Laureate of the United States. Poems are not words after all, but fires for the cold, ropes let down to the lost, something as necessary as bread in the pockets of the hungry. And we'll come back to that uh, later, but that's just a lovely kind of thing, I think. Now, this was upside down before, but I think I've got it. Okay. So, little apologetics. Why on earth are we studying poetry, really, uh, on Wednesday nights at church? Well, for one reason, to defend the structure and the beauty and the creativity of poetry, one needs only to look at the Bible, for example. Um, the, you can look at the Psalms, the Song of Solomon, the parables of Jesus, the metaphorical language that's uh, in the Old and the New Testaments, and even what, and I don't call it this, actually in Touchstone there was this wonderful article last month, and I'll make copies for anybody who wants it, uh, Poet of Heaven and Earth, and that poet is God. And the writer speaks of the voice of God that you hear uh, in the Old Testament, uh, notably in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. When God is speaking, he speaks poetry he argues here. And I think probably to read the Bible in the original Hebrew, you'd really see the, the poetry in the Psalms and in some of them. And I don't. Does anybody read Hebrew? Anybody know Hebrew in here? Yeah. Good for you. Well, I don't know it word by word, but we do read Hebrew. It's not talking about the language. Of the language, no. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Um, you know, so, so let me just start with, with uh, something that I'll read to you. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Set me as a seal upon your heart, a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. And I know you know where that comes from. Uh, Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. Beautiful poetry. Beautiful poetry. And that poetry is echoed many times in different ways um, throughout the Bible. So truly, one only needs to look at the Bible to defend you know, the, the beauty and the creativity um, and even the structure of poetry. We'll look at some of the Psalms in terms of structure. Um, Anyway, but we'll get to that. So, um, the word poet, by the way, comes from the Greek word which means maker. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it's P O I E I N, the Greek for maker. Uh, and so, as an image bearer of God, man possesses the ability both to create something beautiful and to delight in it. I think that's wonderful. And that's Abraham Kuyper, which some of you know, and that's from uh, essays, no, lectures on Calvinism, which is interesting. Okay. Now, uh, the hardest part for me, and here's, here's my little book of poems, is to, was to decide how am I going to structure this? Do I go chronologically by poet? Do I do it thematically? Uh, or do I do it by structure? How am I going to do this? because I, I don't have a book, I'm just sort of giving it to y'all, things that I have loved over the years. 
So what we're going to do, some weeks we're going to do it, we'll, we'll have a theme, and the theme one week is going to be love, one week it'll be loss, one week hope, one week songs of innocence and experience, creation, God's grandeur, comfort and joy, the world of work. Jeff has already seen one of my world of work poems. Sometimes we'll do it by structure and just take a look at sonnets uh, from various poets. Uh, some are we sing. And I almost entitled that, Ere We Sang Them, but didn't quite know where to put the apostrophe because Phil <laughs> kept telling me it was wrong and I kept thinking it was right. But anyway, so. But some of the hymns in our hymn book were poems long before anybody ever set them to music. And that, that's, that's, I think you'll find that interesting. Uh, and then some of them we're going to look at that were written as hymns, but, oh my word, they're beautiful poetry, too. And I think it'll make us appreciate, and I think, I, I, you probably, all of you do have an eye, but I don't know how many of you notice how the hymns we sing are connected to the lessons that are appointed for the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the communion music. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really thoughtful. So words in these hymns are important, and so I think to have a look at some of them will be a good thing. Um, some by poet, we'll probably spend maybe two Wednesdays on John Milton, and um, maybe probably a whole day on Dunn. They're just sort of unto themselves. Now the final week will be the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It'll either be the Wednesday before Thanksgiving or the Wednesday before the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I'm not sure which they're going to do. But what I want to look at is Poetry as a Means of Grace. And that title will become a little clearer to you in a minute. And then also ones that you have found to be, either from this class or from your own experience, Fires for the Cold, Ropes Let Down for the Lost, and Bread in the Pockets of the Hungry. Because I know that you have a wealth of poetry that has meant something to you over the years, and I think that really might be fun right before Thanksgiving to um, to kind of consider that. And then I'm also going to give you some handouts because you either have children or grandchildren or both, and um, some poems that we do at our house with our little children for Thanksgiving. And some of them are really simple. I'll just do you the first and last verse of one. If I had been a pilgrim child among the forests deep and wild, a cabin would have been my home. And on that first Thanksgiving day, I would have knelt with friends to pray, to thank the Lord for all his care in keeping us together there. And that might be a fun little poem to, so someone like that. That is beautiful. Oh, it is a beautiful little poem, it really is. It goes on about the bearskin rug and the fire and the fireplace and all that. Are you gonna have a handout for us to use for that Thanksgiving. Oh, yes. I'm going to have a handout. I am Miss Handout. As y'all know from the great divorce, yeah, I got a handout. So, so throughout each week, we'll have a few words about figurative language. We'll have a meter, rhyme, structure, sound devices. I don't want to make a whole lesson on those, but as we encounter them, um, we will we'll encounter them. So... Um, you know what, I'll do this because I don't want to interrupt what we're going to do with your children. Some of the things uh, that you might want to consider going forward as you read um, poems. When you read a poem, if you're on your own, ask yourself three questions. Who's the speaker of the poem? Who's the voice in the poem? The speaker is not always the poet. Matter of fact, most times he's not the poet. So ask yourself, who is the speaker? What's the occasion? What is the occasion? And what is the central purpose of the poem? And the central purpose of a poem can be all kinds of things. It could be to convey an experience. It can be more didactic, that there's a lesson that the poet wants to convey. Um, Any number of things. But those three questions are really good guides. And then notice as we read the poems, and you can find this too, especially in the Psalms, um, the poetic devices of repetition one thing that makes these um, poems so memorable is that there are built-in devices that will help you remember them, and repetition is the best way. There's repetition of sound, and that's like alliteration and assonance, consonance, uh, um, 
a, a rhyme, a real <coughs> meter, parallel structure. Notice the parallel structure in the Psalms. It's really something. Mm -hmm. But this meter thing, I wrote out here. Uh, do you know what the, uh, best y'all can tell me, the four basic poetic feet are? Okay, well, I'll give you a little hand up next week. But it's iambic, trochaic, dactylic, anapestic. And um, two of them are double meters and two of them are triple meters. But um, I'll tell you what, and then, then we'll get into other things. But I'll just put this in your mind, and then when we get to it, you'll go, oh, I know this already. <laughs> Stephanie Zimbalist, who was Brian? Who was Stephanie Zimbalist? Uh, she played Remington Steele's assistant on the show Remington Steele. Yes, yeah, she played Remington Steele's assistant. And Remington Steele was played by Pierce Brosnan. He was so cute and so young. But she was interviewed, uh, and her, her father was fa a very famous man, Ephraim Zimbalist, and she never changed her name. And she was on one of the night talk shows, it might have been Johnny Carson, and, they, and he said to her, why didn't you change your name, Stephanie Zimbalist? And she said, I like my name, it's Dactylic Demeter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and what she meant was, this measure right here is a dactyl. It's one stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. So she was Stephanie Zimbalist. And since there are two of them, it's diameter, two meters. So I like my name. It's dactylic demeter. So Stephanie Zimbalist. So remember that. So you already know dactyl now, and you already know demeter. That's good. OK. Now, next. Ooh. I don't know what that is. I don't think I was supposed to touch that. It's recording it's your, your voice. Oh, your lovely. Class. Okay. 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 Now, there's a, a book that I would recommend to you. I don't think you can find it anymore. It's called Poetry as a Means of Grace. And it's by Charles Grosvenor Osgood. It began as a series of lectures uh, given at Princeton University in 1940. Um, and it was so wonderfully good. He was really talking to future seminarians and English majors. But um, in this, he urges, especially those going into the ministry, to read widely in poetry. And he says, um, choose a poet and make him yours. Um, he goes on to say that, well, I'll, that's in the next slide. I'll show you that. But he said, and as you read the poets, and I would consider, I would urge you to do this too. You really don't need a teacher. I, I don't believe you do to help you with poetry. If you just engage with the word and read the poem over and over and just let it sink in, your instincts are good. And um, you, you will just, anyway, make him yours. Make him yours. I have uh, texted um, John Michael to ask him who his poet is. I will be really interested to find out what he says. But, um, and Osgood goes on to say, don't, don't, don't consult other books or other people by a way of explaining him any more than you can help. Know him first of all yourself. Let him explain himself. Um, he recommends, he has a, has a five chapter book. The first chapter is Your Poet, where he he discusses the value of poetry. Um, he suggests for himself Dante, Milton, Sir Edmund Spencer, and uh, Samuel Johnson, who really wasn't so much of a poet as a thinker writer, but those four men, um, he says. But there are any, those are his, but there are any number of them who are wonderful. Um, but this David, this T. David Gordon, took Grosvenor's book and wrote a book entitled Why Johnny Can't Preach. And I have put down there, and Andrew Allen and Morgan can. And the reason that um, Gordon says that Johnny can't preach, um, this is something called, this is from something that he wrote in Table Talk magazine. It's called A Literate ministry, and I, I can run that off for y'all if any of you want it. Some readers of Table Talk are familiar with the Levi P. Stone lectures given annually 
at Princeton Seminary for over a century. In 1940, they were given by Charles Grosvenor Osgood and later published as Poetry as a Means of Grace. Osgood did not argue that poetry was a means of grace in the technical theological sense. Rather, he argued that a minister's usefulness in the pulpit would be determined in a substantial way by the poetry he would or would not read for the remainder of his life. Such reading, he argued, would have a profound influence on style, though not because of a particular poet's style would be imitated, but also on his perceptiveness and his vigor. And y'all, I think about that a lot as I listen to both Andrew and remember John Michael, mm -hmm. both of whom are literate people. Yeah. And um, they, they, ha they, I know Andrew does, and you knew John Michael did, does still. Um, I think Andrew is probably a little more reluctant to, uh, from the pulpit, let us know his great literary background, but he's got a super literary background. But you see it in his, um, in the way he can deliver his message and preach the gospel. And John Michael was that same kind of compelling speaker. And I would argue it's because they read. They probably didn't go to the Stone Lectures at Princeton. But um, so this is an excerpt from uh, Osgood's book that I thought was interesting. And I'm so sorry it's doing this. And I will. I'll run this off for y'all. Literature serves its best ends and keeps itself procreative by ministering pleasurably to the spiritual needs in any generation to which it may survive. Instead of leveling sacred literature down to its own plane, secular literature dignifies itself to higher ends, as Virgil is dignified and illuminated by his service to Dante. And as Virgil might not enter paradise, so secular literature cannot equal holy writ in power or authority or efficacy as a means of grace yet it may illustrate, reinforce, verify, and illuminate holy writ and warp the world into the range and field of its magnetic influence. It may serve us as the sycamore tree served Zacchaeus to gain a clearer sight of the incarnate truth. And that's truly what I'm hoping that this poetry will do. And You'll see the, the greats that you know are Christian poets. And we'll start with George Herbert. But then there's also a poem, uh, The Hardware Store as Proof of the Existence of God. By, I mean, you're just going to see all kinds of things. But I hope in all of these that we really will give, have a clearer vision of the truth that's in the Bible so that the words of men um, serve their God will. So, all righty. Now, I'm going to stop here, and then I'll go back there. Yeah, don't read that anymore. Okay, now I've got handouts. And I, we're going to have so many handouts that what you may, I, I really thought I could go get these for like a, a, a nickel or something and give them every to everybody in the class, but they were all gone. Should have done it early. I mean, not even for 50 cents could I find them. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be two pages. All right. Let's see. Howard, how would you like to? That's Harold. Harold. I know it. You know what? I know it. I know it. Let, let me tell you. I know, let me I, know tell you. I know his name is Harold. This is Jane Howard, all written, and I wanted to make. Her kneeler is so perfect that I wouldn't <laughs> She did. Yeah. Okay. Would you hand those out on your side? Yeah. All righty. You want to have two pages, and one is going to look like this. And then yeah, one is going to have two poems on <laughs> each page. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, 
Silvering. Have I got two pages? Johnny, don't you want two pages? <laughs> he wants to go to sleep, so he wants to go. <laughs> well, I'm on to you, Johnny. <laughs> She knows. I know, Johnny. All right. You know, um, no else. All right. You visually, and somebody asked me, what's the difference between prose and poetry? Well, that would that would be a whole class. But take a look at this page. This is prose. Take a look at this page or this page. This is poetry. I mean, visually, you can look at it and see what's the difference. I, the big difference, though, is not how it looks on the page, but how poetry can convey a truth in the most subtle and inviting way. Um, as it's set up there, uh, it can illustrate, it can reinforce, it can verify, it can illuminate. Uh, it can it just gives us a different way of looking at the very same thing that a factual um, presentation won't give us. Because poetry allows us, because of the, the, the metaphorical language and because of its, doesn't have to be literal. It just moves us to give us a bigger kind of picture. So, some of you, we're going to start with this, and we're going to ask Jane. Yeah. To read this in a minute. Right up here, this page, right here, I want to start with. This is a copy of pages 88 and 89 in my old 1928 prayer book. And, uh, Jane, have I written what that is? Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Read along. Jane's going to read it. And read along as Jane reads. Okay. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. I come on. Okay. 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 Y'all, I was so excited when Lynn asked me to read this because I've never read a, a word in the 1928 prayer book, and and so I was excited to be able to do it. And um, I think y'all will, will be a little bit surprised if you don't know the 1928 prayer book by heart. Okay. Dearly beloved brethren on, I intend by God's grace to celebrate the Lord's Supper, unto which in God's behalf I bid you all who are here present and beseech you for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake that ye not refuse to come thereto. Being so lovingly called and bidden by God himself, Ye know how grievous and unkind a thing it is. When a man hath prepared a rich feast, decked his table with all kind of provision, so that there lacketh nothing but the guests to sit down, and yet they who are called, without any cause, most unthankfully refuse to come. Which of you, in such a case, would not be moved? Who would not think a great injury and wrong done unto him? Wherefore, most dearly beloved in Christ, take ye good heed, lest ye, withdrawing yourselves from this holy supper, provoke God's indignation against you. It is an easy matter for a man to say, I will not communicate because I am otherwise hindered with worldly business. But such excuses are not so easily accepted and allowed before God. If any man say, I'm a grievous sinner and therefore am afraid to come, wherefore then do ye not repent and amend? When God calleth you, are ye not ashamed to say, ye will not come? When ye should return to God, will you excuse yourselves and say, we, ye are not ready? Consider earnestly with yourselves 
how little such feigned excuses will avail before God. Those who refused the feast in the gospel because they had bought a farm or would try their yokes of oxen or because they were married were not so excused but counted unworthy of the heavenly feast. Wherefore, according to mine office, I bid you in the name of God, I call you in Christ's behalf, I exhort you as ye love your own salvation, that ye will be partakers of this holy communion. And as the Son of God did vouchsafe to yield up his soul by death upon the cross for your salvation, so it is your duty to receive the communion in remembrance of the sacrifice of his death as he himself hath commanded, which if you shall neglect to do, consider with yourselves how great is your ingratitude to God and how sore punishment hangeth over your heads for the same. When ye willfully abstain from the Lord's table and separate from your brethren, who come to feed on the banquet of that most heavenly food. These things, if ye earnestly consider, ye will, by God's grace, return to a better mind. For the obtaining whereof, we shall not cease to make our humble petitions unto Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Y'all, I had never... I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn. It never entered my mind that somebody wouldn't take communion, that wouldn't come and bow before Jesus Christ for all he did for us. Thank you for asking me to read it. I loved it. Oh, thank you for saying yes. And I'll be asking many of you because... Um, well, we've got some great actresses in this class and some great readers, and uh, we do. And, and this, this is your class, is your class. So, um, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You know, as old as this language is, this, I, I grew up with the 28th prayer book. So, um, and I heard this a couple of times growing up that I can remember. And my sister driving home one day from the, the the priest had read that exhortation. Uh, she she said, "Why is he reading it? Because people who need it aren't here." <laughs> <laughs> and my dad, I remember, was speechless. <laughs> I mean, what's the answer to that? But as you can see in the little bitty print, there's an exhortation before that on pages um, probably 86 and 87 that's a, that's a different tone. It's just the necessity of, of um, communion. And, and the, in the little bitty print, or in case he shall see the people negligent to come to the Holy Communion, instead of the former, um, he may use this exhortation, um, which is... Uh, it's just so beautiful. Remember some of the words in, in that you heard Jane read. Um, how many of you grew up with the 28 prayer book? Lynn, in the Methodist Church, all the order of worship is the 28 prayer book. And we didn't really know that at the time. I didn't know that until I uh, gave language. But it was. Mm -hmm. I still had my book. And it was 28. It was basically the prayer book in the back of the hymn book. And, and the language in the 28 prayer book is not all that far removed from the ones centuries before. Yeah. Really. So, um, would that be the 1662 or something? Yeah, no. the first one was, yeah, the first one was in the 1500s uh, that Thomas Cranmer did. As a matter of fact, I've got some kind of outline of that because I, I want you to see where the poets, Milton, Dunn, Shakespeare, and Herbert, fit into um, the Renaissance, what's going on? When's the King James Bible? When was Thomas Cranmer's prayer book first done? And it's really interesting to see um, where these folks fit in. 
All right, we're going to skip over this, and then because I want what Jane read to be fresh in your mind, and turn to Love 3. Now, George Herbert, and we'll get to Herbert in a minute. I think, I think we'll just look at the poem and not have an interruption with the writer yet. Um, Herbert wrote three poems that he entitled Love, and this was the third one. Um, these weren't published until after his death, by the way. He, didn't, he was not a poet. We'll find out who he was in a minute. What? Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then, I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Now, that first question, who is the speaker? There's, there could be more than one speaker in the poem. We've got two speakers here. Um, I always like to read at the, to me, you have to read a poem at least three times before it starts to, to sink in. So um, if you, the, uh, the quotation marks, oftentimes, Punctuation. When you get something like this, pay attention to the punctuation because it will clearly mark who the speaker is and then who the next speaker is. Um, Harold, if would you would you be the the first? Will you begin with a guest? I answered worthy to be here. Would you be that person? Okay. okay. And then. Um, let me see. Brian, will you be the second? And, and the punctuation will be a good guide. And Hammond, would you read the first stanza, please? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love observing me grow slack from my first entrance in drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. And then he would normally continue, but I want to stop here and, and look at that first stanza. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. Who are these two speakers? Do you have an idea even from this first reading? Who has a Bible that they could turn to uh, 1 John 4, 8? Or who knows, I mean, probably you know 1 John 4, 8 right off the top of your head. Okay, Brian, you got it. Will you read? Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Okay. Anyone who knows not love knows not God, for God is love. For God is love. All right. Now, we're, we're going to change readers, but it's going to be the same speaker. Okay. A, a guest, I answer. We'll start there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A guest, I answer, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, oh my dear, I cannot look on thee. 
Love took my hand and smiling did reply, Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have married now, that my shame go where it does deserve. And know you not, said love, who bore the blame? My dear, then, I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Oh, okay. Uh, watch that punctuation because yeah. that'll, that'll help. Um, and see what else? See that one line in? That's a tricky line there. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? But notice the punctuation ends there, and, and it's, it's the speaker again, the, the man. My dear, then I will serve. And that, if you have, a, well, when you get home, look at, look at Luke 12, 37. It's, um, it, it will explain the I will serve reference there. And anybody know why I've got Exodus 4, 10 through 11 written down there? Look up with, um, who made the eyes but I? Oh, yeah, um, in the second stanza. I, the unkind, ungrateful, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Mm. Who, is, who's, who says that in Exodus? Who feels unworthy? Not the eyes, but the voice. Moses. 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 Well, he says, hey, I, I, I don't have, the, I'm not eloquent. Mm -hmm. And God said, who made your mouth? I did. You can do this. So it, it echoes that um, uh, in, in the Exodus. This, which, let's read it one more time. Okay. All right. You want to read it by speakers or want me to read it? You read it. All right. Sure. Okay. Love bade me welcome. Yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. Notice the gentleness of this love. Mm -hmm. And notice how quick-eyed he is. He's, he notices everything God does, this, this love. Notice his everything. So gentle. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Mm -hmm. Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. What is this an invitation to? Communion. Yes. If, if, Absolutely, and it, and it totally echoes this prose, doesn't it? Yes. Even to the ingratitude that uh, when, you, when you look back at this and, and the feast, the banquet, uh, the Lord has set a table for you and you are not going to come to this table. Maybe, you know, this is because you, maybe you bought a farm or maybe you just got married or whatever the reason is. But um, it may be that you feel Unworthy, yeah. absolutely unworthy. Yeah. When he, when the sinner, I call him the sinner, the guest is the sinner, says, "I answered, worthy to be here." At the time that was written, does worthy mean what we think it means now, or does worthy mean basically lucky to be here? No, it meant uh, he uh, he is un unworthy. He is not his worth, his value is he's not he's not undeserving. Um, no, I don't think it means lucky. But you know what? I'll double check. The guess is saying uh, a guess. The 
sinner says, worthy to be here. Right. He said, he, here's this, do, I, do you like anything? And he said, yes, I like being worthy to be a guest at this banquet. Does that answer that? Yeah. A guest worthy to be here. Yeah, I, I wish that I were a guest yeah. worthy to be here. Okay. It's okay. it's the kind of inversion of the language. Okay. Um, well, haven't we all felt unworthy at some time or another? Yes. Isn't that just part of the human yeah. psyche that yeah. we are? And, and that's why I love the prayer of humble access. We are not yes. worthy enough to gather up the crumbs of the new table. Right. But... You are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Property, I'm going back to the old prayer book. We I now say, probably now say, yes. whose character, whose property is always to have mercy. Thank God for your mercy. Yes, thank God. Thank God. Um, and, okay, any other questions as we're walking through this? Because I love it. So fast. Okay. Um, and this, the, the, in the last stanza, and when he says, truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. I don't, I, I don't deserve to be in your presence because I am a sinner. And then love replies, and know you not, says love, who bore the blame? George Herbert may be one of my favorite poets, and he really is kind of unrecognized. But, and this was, I'm going to take a little break here. Um... I told you I had a hard time deciding where things could go. You're going to be really surprised to see that some of George Herbert's poems are in our hymnal. That's what I was going to ask. Do we know what persuasion he was at the time? Oh, he was an Anglican priest. Okay. I'm going to get to him in a minute. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I wanted Jane. I wanted this poem back to back with what Jane read. Okay. This is just cool, don't you think? It's, I, and I think also this could be an invitation simply to come into God's presence and come into his kingdom. You know, I think it's definitely an invitation to the feast, to the banquet. But I think we're also invited as to come into the kingdom of heaven, to, to come into being Christians, being believers. George Herbert, we'll talk about him in a minute. Oh, by the way, now down at the bottom of what Jane was, um, and we're not going to get into her, but she's interesting. And uh, Simone Vile, some people say, they never say it W. Simone Vile, Simone Vale, she was a 20th century French kind of mystic. But she wrote this, and you can look up Simone. I heard by chance of the existence of one of those English poets of the 17th century who are named metaphysical. I discovered the poem called Love. I learned it by heart. Often I make myself say it over, concentrating all my attention upon it and clinging with all my soul to the tenderness it enshrines. I used to think I was merely reciting it as a beautiful poem, but without my knowing it, the recitation had the virtue of a prayer. It was during one of these recitations that, as I told you, Christ himself came down and took possession of me. Until last, some, last September, I had never once prayed to God all my life. Oh. And the poem that she is talking about is the poem that we just read. So, you know, wh why poetry? Well, here's a great example right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that just by saying this over and over and over, it, it became a prayer and it became something that led her to Christ. Now, all right, now I'm gonna get to George Herbert. Okay, George Herbert. He is often called England's greatest religious poet. Now some of you might wanna know, well, why not John Donne? He wrote, you know, Holy Silence, a lot of stuff. We'll talk about that later, but England's greatest religious poet. He was born in 1593, and he died in 1633. He's classified as a metaphysical poet. If you read a lot of his poetry, you'll, you'll see the metaphys metaphysics really operating in them. He came from a prominent and wealthy family. He was Cambridge-educated and elected to Parliament. 
but he chose to become an Anglican parish priest in a small rural village. And uh, his poems were not published until after his death. He wrote them for his congregation. He wrote them for, for himself. Um, and, the, and when his poems were published, the last poem, and he did put them all in a book. He did arrange them. But the last poem in the book was Love Three. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he was saving the best to last. I, I don't know. But um, anyway, Herbert is fabulous. And one of the, one of the, as I told you, the, the things I struggled with was, okay, should we go on and take some of these poems that Herbert wrote and, and just see Herbert, or shall I save them for the hymns? So I decided, I'll save them for the hymns. And then you go, oh, I know George Herbert. I know him. Okay, we got one more Herbert. I see. Um, all righty. Yeah. Don't, okay. Do you have, and that's Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Do you have Aaron? Okay. Okay. Aaron by George Herbert. Holiness on the head, light and perfections on the breast, harmonious bells below, raising the dead to lead them unto life and rest. Thus are true Aaron's dressed. Profaneness in my head, Defects and darkness in my breast, a noise of passions ringing me for dead unto a place where is no rest. Poor priest, thus am I dressed. Only another head I have, another heart and breast, another music, making live, not dead, without whom I could have no rest. In him I am well dressed. Christ is my only head, my alone only heart and breast, my only music, striking me even dead, that to the old man I may rest, and be in him new dressed. So, holy in my head, perfect and light in my dear breast, my doctrine tuned by Christ who is not dead, but lives in me while I do rest. Come, people, Aaron's dress. Now, remember, George Herbert was an Anglican priest in a small little parish. Um, who is Aaron? Another thing I could have written up there, besides who's the speaker, what's the occasion, what's the central purpose of the form, is look at, be sure to look at the title. He's a priest in the Old Testament. Absolutely. Priest of the Old Testament. He was the first Old Testament priest. And in, do I have this written down? I hope so. Maybe I don't. So, okay. Aaron is the first Old Testament high priest. Take a look at Exodus 28, 2 through 38. It's a long, 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 long passage. But, um, and I didn't, I didn't write down everything I could because I couldn't fit it on the little thing. But, um, it's, it's, it says he's got to have a turban, he's got to have all kind of things. But you shall make a breastpiece of judgment. You shall set in it four rows of stones set in gold filigree, the twelve stones so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on his heart. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place. Um, I'm going to see if I've got a better picture. You know what? We're just going to have to get a better computer for somebody that won't. Where is Oh, I'm going to pass this one around. Because you can see the color a little more clearly. And you can see, pass it around. Okay. You can see the, oh, yeah, um, you can. When, you, when you read Exodus, go, go and look at it. See, isn't that cool? And the, the, uh, they go to the color yarn that needs to be employed, the colors, um, the, the kinds of stones that these 12 stones have to be. And in one row, oh my goodness, one was a diamond, one was an emerald, and one was a sapphire. But then there's some lesser stones. One was a jasper, but that's okay. Anyway, but these stones, it just must have been brilliant looking. But 
Aaron was the first Old Testament high priest. And you see, he's, uh, he has a hat. That's his breastplate. And as I pass that around, the bells go around the hem of his vestment. Uh, on its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns with bells of gold between them. Can't you just see that? So, no, you can't. So, <laughs> anyway, Mama tried. <laughs> okay, um, so, now let's go back and take a look at the poem. Aaron, holiness on the head, light and perfections on the breast, Harmonious bells below, raising the dead to lead them unto life and rest. Thus are true Aaron's dress. Okay, see? He's got on his head, he's got the breastplate, he's got the bells around here. Okay, there, that's how a true Aaron, a true priest, is dressed. But this priest says, and you know what? Listen sometimes, because Andrew will say this. He, he, will, he will, not, will remind us that he is maybe a worse sinner than all of us. And we've heard him say that before. And, uh, uh, and I think to, to get, and one of the things we'll talk about when we consider three ways to look at this point, one of them is consider our priest. And he may feel profaneness in my head defects and darkness in my breast, a noise of passion ringing me for dead unto a place where is no rest, poor priest, thus am I dressed. I think sometimes we forget that our priests are human. They, they are human beings. And um, so, here is where the turn starts. Only another head I have, another heart and breast, another music, making live, not dead, without whom I could have no rest. In him I am well dressed. And I'm a little surprised that that H is capitalized at this point. Christ is my only head, my alone only heart and breast, my only music striking me even dead, that to the old man I may rest and be in him new dressed. So, holy in my head, perfect and light in my dear breast, my doctrine tuned by Christ, who is not dead, but lives in me while I do rest. Come, people, Aaron's dressed. So, I, I think you can look at this in one way as perhaps um, a, a, a priest Dressing himself, not literally, but in his mind, in his soul, in his heart, to 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 be our shepherd. Um, and I think it might help us to think about about um, it's it's a good way I think to look at at our clergy and um, and say you know what they might have to struggle like we do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, give them a little mercy sometimes. But also, I think of it as us. How do we prepare? How do we dress to come to church? How how do you? Do, I, I know I know what helps me dress the most, and that's when I walk into church, and the first thing I do is kneel. When we enter the pew. We, we kneel and spend that little time in or longer or whatever in prayer and just get your head out of the parking lot and out of whatever the grandchildren have done or whatever the parents are upset about what the grandchildren have done or whatever is going on and just, you know, get Christ in your head, Christ in your heart. So I think it's an interesting way to look at this. Now the structure of this I think is, is interesting. Did, did you all notice that the first line of every stanza ends with the same word? Head, 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 head. And the second line, breast, 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 breast. 
and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. So that the, it's just structured. It's just such a lovely one. Such a lovely one. Okay, questions, observations about this poem? Like it? Yes. You like you like George Herbert? He's super. Now I'll tell you what, if you have a hymnal at home, you can be light years ahead of me. Look at the back of the book under um, you know, there'll be the noise of the choir, they're all the choir practice. Uh, in the back of the book, it'll be uh, listed uh, in the index by authors, translators, composers. Look under the authors and look up George Herbert and see how many of his hymns are in our prayer book. Not our prayer book, our hymn book. So I wonder, is, was the first president of Bush named after him, George Herbert Walker Bush? I would like to think so. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good question. I'll say yes. Um, you know what? I just might write him. Yeah. Yeah. What a good question. I, I, I thought about that and thought, why not? He's a, why not? Why do you watch your back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have, I think, about four minutes, two minutes. Yeah, sure. Just about three. Three? Okay. Um, Lynn. Yes. What you said about coming to church and being dressed and coming in and grabbing the neighbor and then is, is also, coincidentally, the reason why Andrew moved the baptismal clock to the front of the nave. Yes. For the same reason. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, it's that same kind of preparation. Ignore that's that. Now that that's me, but I'm just gonna um, make it stop. Are you busy teaching school? Yeah, it's probably no, it's probably not. It's probably my daughter thinking she needs to give me a two minute warning. Uh, anyway. So oh, no. you're right, Jeff. Yes, absolutely. Jeff, what were you saying? Is the same reason, love? What were you saying? The, the reason that Andrew moved the baptismal font from where it was, a, a, a right. the chancel area, to right. the front of the nave was for preparation purposes. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure Absolutely. Yeah. Both coming in. Get you in the right spirit. And remind you of you. I... None of y'all are going to be late for uh, supper tonight, that's for sure. Um, okay, but Jeff, thank you. Because we, um, we, we too dress ourselves and prepare our hearts and our minds. But isn't that illuminating sometimes to see a picture? It is for me. I'm not a, did y'all, did that picture get around so y'all could see the color? Did y'all ever get to see it? I held it up. Yeah. Really, I thought this will not happen again. And I'm being videotaped. This is so professional. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Anybody else? Jeff, yeah, that's so right. Um, next week, we'll, we'll kind of put some of these people in perspective with what's going on because we've, we've looked at John, uh, George Herbert. I can't decide whether to do John Dunn next week or go into the theme of love. Anybody have any druthers? You decide. You, you, yeah, you, I think you decide because you're we'll trust 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 we have. You decide, because oh. you thought about it a little bit more than we have. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably do John Dunn then. Um, okay. And uh, there he is. And he if we don't, does. and we'll probably, if we do Dunn, then we're going to touch on the Italian sonnet. If we don't, then we're going to get into love with um, four different 
actually six different poets that are really kind of cool. And the fun thing about this is that I have, believe me, I'm not going to do anything that Andrew doesn't approve of. Because there have been some, you know, uh, that I wanted his input on, but um, he's okay with everything we do. Except my telephone. <laughs> and I didn't tell him about that. Okay. Okay. Jeff, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come to this your church and to learn more and more about Christianity in all ways, fundamentals and the finer points. Lord, we give thanks for this opportunity. Bless this gathering of people in this church tonight as we go for dinner. And bless the dinner and all the wonderful hands that have prepared it. Lord, we ask that your blessings on everyone in this building and all of the families. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Oh, thank you.